firm foundations. And the reason I'm so excited about it is I just believe that it's, it's kind of what we all need, what God's church as a whole across the world needs. Um, and as a result of that, what our world needs uh, more than anything. So I'm gonna make a big ask. I, I think I've only done this a couple times in the history of our church, but I wanna ask you to not miss church for the next 10 weeks. Like if you could just do 10 in a row, I know for some of you like, that sounds crazy. The next 10 weeks, because I, I just, and if you do miss, maybe you're sick, you're out of town, whatever, you know, we have all of it online. Um, Cause I believe it's gonna build your life. I really do. And I believe it's gonna build your ability to parent. And I believe it's gonna make you a better spouse. And I believe it's gonna bring clarity about some things that there's a, a lot of real confusion about in the world today. We no longer live in a nation that holds high the Judeo-Christian values and worldview. Uh, I was born in 1981. When I was a kid, even people who didn't believe in Jesus looked a lot more like Christians today than some Christians today. And so that's why it's so important we talk about this. Like at this point in the history of, of our world and human history and in the history of this nation particularly, like your beliefs, if you're a Jesus follower, should be radically different than the world. Not just a little different, radically different. And so I wanted to get your gears turning a little and ask you a couple questions. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and just think about these questions for a second. What do you behold? Behold just means what do you look at? What do you hold up? Like what captivates you? What do you behold? Are you captivated by the scriptures? or by the prevailing ideologies around you? And last, do you have any convictions? Okay, now listen to the scripture, and then we'll get started. First Timothy chapter four, starting in verse one. It's on the screen if you wanna read it. It says, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith which I think would infer that there's now a false version of the faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings. And if you've looked around at some of the stuff people are buying into these days and you're like, where does this come from? Here's one of the places that comes from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. Verse seven, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself. That's what we're gonna do for 10 weeks. Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and the life to come. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this would be a life-changing, faith-building, journey for so many of us, God, that, that brings us to a place where we truly feel in our souls that we are standing on a firm foundation, that our faith is more certain than ever, more strong than ever, and more clear than ever. God, I'm going to pray that it becomes so clear for us as a church that when we walk into the office or to the classroom on Monday morning and we're faced with some random question, we can actually give answers. We would have courage. We'd stop backing down when it comes to the spiritual battle that we're in, but that we would stand up for truth and for your kingdom. God, help us to remember as we study your word, we don't battle against flesh and blood. It feels so often like this is a battle against people. It's not, your word is clear. We actually battle the powers and principalities of darkness in this world. And, and we don't battle against people, we actually battle for people. So I just pray that would be the heart behind everything we do. We'd battle for our families. We'd battle for the next generation. We would battle for our communities. We'd battle for our church. We'd battle for the people in our office. We'd battle for the people that we're friends with, God. Father, we don't need to, to hear from Zach. We need to hear from your word. Would you move in our lives today? In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. High five three people if you're ready. Three people, high five, high five, high five, and then grab a seat. And we will jump in. Look, we're going old school. You got paper handouts. There's a little letter from me on there. You don't need to read it now, but maybe when you get home, that'll just kind of provide more context for this journey we're going on over the next 10 weeks. 
Today, what I want to do is kind of introduce where we're going. Uh, give you some, some boundaries that we're going to run in for this journey and, and kind of help you see how important it is that, that one, you're connected to, and two, you have understanding of the timeless truths of our faith in Jesus. As a church body, uh, we have convictions about things. And so today what I want to ask is, I asked it earlier when your eyes are closed, do you? Do you have convictions? Because I care that you have convictions. I hope you care that you have convictions. Here's what I know. If you have no convictions, you will be easily convinced of all kinds of lies, all kinds of deceptive truths like it talked about in 1 Timothy. Look at Ephesians 4. This is, this is another really good scripture providing us context for where we're going, the heart behind this. It says, then we will no longer be like immature children. Now, we are all on a journey to become more and more like Jesus. We're all growing in our faith. I don't know about you, but from time to time, I'll encounter something, I'll go through something, I'll think something, I'm like, man, there, here's a part of my faith, I'm still like an immature little kid, and I need to grow up. It says, we won't be tossed and blown around uh, by every wind of new teaching. I find it interesting, the word choice, wind, because wind just comes and goes. Anybody awake in the storm last night? Did y'all? I didn't get any rain at my house. Can you believe that? Thunder, lightning, trees blew over, no rain, grass still dying. Pray for rain, y'all, all right? <laughs> we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. And man, that is happening. That is happening. Instead, we will speak the truth. That's right, God's people are called to courageously speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body. Let's not forget that, the church. Jesus is in charge of this thing. So basically it says, like, here's your options. Grow in your faith or get run over and drug around by the world. I wonder which one is your life. Here's just a little tip for you on that scripture. Um, anytime you hear some guy on TikTok you know, and they got 50,000 followers, so you think you should listen to them. I'm talking to young people right now. And they say, oh, I discovered this new truth. You should be skeptical. Anytime somebody claims like, I figured something out about the Christian faith, about the Bible, about God, about Jesus, that 2,000 years of Christians before me weren't able to figure out, you should be like, shut up, dude. <laughs> Really? You really think like you're more brilliant than 2,000 years of Christians before? Talk to the hand. That's what you need to do, all right? <laughs> How do you make sure you're not tricked? How do you make sure you're not tossed around by the lies? The answer is you have to understand the timeless truths of the Christian faith. The uh, scholarly word is orthodoxy. Everybody say orthodoxy. 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 <laughs> wow. I didn't have enough coffee today. Orthodoxy, y'all pray for me, four services today, guys. <laughs> Orthodoxy, here's the, the simple definition. It's just the set of doctrines believed, uh, agreed upon, lived out by the early Christians. But, but here's a definition I really like, and I put it at the top of your notes because I, I wanted you to go home with this word for word. Okay, you don't have to try to write it. It's on your little handout. And this is from uh, Trevin Wax in his book, The Thrill of Orthodoxy, which I would encourage you to read. He says the term orthodoxy refers to the foundational truths consistent with the scriptures upon which Christians through the ages have demonstrated agreement. Orthodoxy is the historic Christian consensus on the essential elements of true faith and practice, what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. Man, there's a lot in there, isn't it? Let's see if we can break that down a little bit today, because what I know is that if I can help you grow in your understanding of these timeless truths, I'm talking about the most important 
foundational and today under attack doctrines of our faith. I don't want to spoil everywhere we're going, and I'm not going to tell you what we're covering which week so that hopefully you'll come every week. But I will tell you this, we're going to cover the Bible and its accuracy, heaven and hell, your sanctification, uh, this whole gender dysphoria, transgender conversation that I think is somewhat interwoven into marriage and God's definition for that. We're going to go there. We're going to talk about that. You're like, which week is that? You better come to all so you don't miss it. These are things that are under attack that we need to understand. These are foundational pieces of the Christian faith. These are things that are kind of crumbling for so many people today inside of the church. Why? Maybe due to their own lack of knowledge, we're going to fix that. Maybe due to a lazy faith, I can't fix that. I can't make you eat. I can only put the meal on the table. Or last, maybe due to a lack of bravery in the midst of this cultural cesspool we're living in. And the ability to just kind of grab on to lies. Here's another thing Trevin Wax said. He said the church faces her biggest challenge not when new errors start to win, but when old truths no longer wow. Gosh, that hit me so hard. That the church is in danger today of drifting away from orthodoxy, not because of all these new errors that are out there in the faith, in the church, which there's many, and we're going to talk about them. But that's not actually the biggest danger. The biggest danger is that as Christians, we're no longer wowed by orthodoxy. We're, we're no, we no longer have this sense of awe for the timeless truths of our Christian faith. Like maybe we take them for granted. And maybe you're kind of a new believer and you're, you're just like, whoa, bro, I'm just here to learn. Cool, we're gonna do that. Maybe you're here, you're not a believer, okay? Here's what I'd say to you. Beautiful, biblical, brilliant that you're here. We love it. We're so excited you're here and we mean that. But for everybody who's been following Jesus for a little while, there's a great question there. Does, does your faith still wow you? Like, do you wake up and God's just another thing about life? Or do you wake up like so pumped every day that you're saved by grace? Like, is church just, okay, Sundays we go to church, that's what we do. It's just on the schedule. It's what a good Christian does, Okay. Listen, church is not some cool songs and a TED talk. That's not church. Man, church is so much more than that. Church is the bride of Christ coming together to meet with God, to worship God, to walk out the doors afterward and bring hope to the world and be who we're called to be. Like, I'm just trying to encourage you. Don't get complacent. Don't uh, let these timeless truths stop wowing your soul. When we think about this stuff, no matter how many times we've thought about this stuff, it's the amazing grace of God. It's the life-changing grace of God. It should, it should fire us up. That's why I love an alive church. That's why I love Ralph and Clorinda. They're like, yeah, yeah, whoa, come on, come on. And the rest of y'all sitting here staring at me like you never heard about Jesus in your life, okay? I'll give you some, some uh, leeway because you're the early service, all right? The gospel, just never forget is it simple? Yes. But it's also simultaneously very complex. That's one of the things that wows me about it, right? It's so incredibly simple that a child can understand it and grasp it and give their life to Jesus. But at the same time, it's so complex that even the greatest scholars in the Christian faith are barely scratching the surface of its glory and its weight. That's what I love about it. Maybe that's the way we get into trouble. It stops wowing us. Here's another way we get into trouble. When we start to kind of let go of the power of our timeless truths and, and we start allowing this lie I'm seeing a lot today, um, that Christianity needs to progress. Oh man, that's so old and outdated. Christianity needs to grow up. Like culture has evolved, y'all. We need to rebrand and rethink and evolve the Christian faith. And what I would say to that is no matter how much humanity progresses, look at me, progresses, and I've got to say it with the finger quotes, progresses, because just because you call something progress doesn't mean it's actually progress. There's a lot of stuff today called progressive that is not bringing progress. It's bringing the opposite of progress. No matter how much humanity progresses, the old truths still have to be our firm foundation or it won't be progress we see. It'll be something different. In fact, let's just do this. Let's check in and see how the progress is progressing. I did some research this week. Look at the screens. Check this out. This is reported happiness in the United States since 1950. Shh. What do we have next? 
next. This is births to single mothers. Okay? Look at, look at how it's, it's just drastically gone up since 1930. Now, not every time would that mean there's not a father figure in the home, but a lot of times it does. And go look at the research on what happens when there's no father figures in the communities. Nobody disagrees on that one. What do we have next? Okay, this is um, deaths of despair. And I want to point out that this chart stops before the pandemic. Okay, so don't look at that and go, oh yeah, well, of course it jumped pandemic. No, this is before that. So this is suicide, alcohol-related, uh, drugs. These are, these are deaths of despair, where people are so uh, distraught that they end up killing themselves or doing something that leads to death. What's next? This one is depressive symptoms in our 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. This, when I read about this, and I know we don't have a ton of time to get really deep into this data today, but, but this broke my heart that our teenagers, this is their mindset, 50% of the time. I can't do anything right, my life's not useful, I do not enjoy life. Something's gotta change, church. And then I think all those first ones are interesting. Look at the last one, okay? The pink line that goes up is hours spent on the internet, social media, YouTube, TikTok, per day. And then green is sleep, purple is in-person, uh, social interaction, blue is happiness. So since 2006, the more time we have spent on the internet, the faster our health has declined in every way. Heartbreaking stuff. The world says, look, we're progressing. I don't call that progress. I call that hell on earth. I'm just trying to show you that this idea, oh, the church needs to progress to progress, to change, to update, to, to rethink. No, we need to stand firm on orthodoxy because look at where the so-called so progress is, is taking us. It's not taking us anywhere good. The world calls it progress. The word calls it decay. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 5, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. You think about what salt was used for in, in Jesus' day, it was a preservative to help resist decay. So Jesus is literally telling us, hey church, you don't affirm lies, you resist decay, and in doing so, you preserve truth. That's gotta happen, that's why we're talking about this stuff. Second Timothy four, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Okay, so let me just stop right there. This scripture is actually written to me, not you. This is written to the, the people that, that run churches. This is Paul talking to church leaders, okay? But it's still a good one for you to know. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So that's my charge as a pastor, to teach the word when it's popular and when it's not popular. In season and out of season to teach the word when you guys like it and you're smiling at me and you're happy and hooping and hollering and to teach the word when y'all are mean mugging me. <laughs> to teach it no matter what anybody says exactly like it says, to rebuke, to exhort, and to be patient and to have a spirit of teaching as I do so. Why? Verse three continues. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Wow. People will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears... They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. That's happening today. People are going out, finding the teacher that will do what they want the teacher to do. I didn't think that was the definition of a teacher. Why do you even need a teacher if you're just going to do whatever the heck you want to do? Live however you want to live. Interpret the word however you want to interpret the word. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's scary stuff to me. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So my job is not to say what you want me to say, it's to say what God's word requires me to say. I don't have the authority to tell you what you want to hear. Only God has that authority. I don't have the authority to, to twist and change the word of God. I can only stand in the authority that the word of God already has. And God's word says that the scriptures are optimal for human flourishing, and that will never change. That it says that these right here, these are timeless truths, orthodoxy. 
So listen, you really only have two options in this life, orthodoxy or heresy. That's it. And today, a lot of people are choosing heresy. Instead of timeless truths, orthodoxy, they're choosing whatever suits them, whatever allows them to live, however they want to live, whatever suits their own passions. Here's some proof of it. This week, I was reading about somebody who posted on a Reddit channel, uh, and the Reddit channel is, is a place for uh, talking about and affirming transgenderism. Uh, they said to chat GTP, hey, write me a Bible verse in the voice of Jesus affirming my transgenderism. And I'm not gonna read the Bible verse that chat GTP wrote because it sounds real and it made me puke in my mouth a little bit. But I will say this, I will quote the person who asked the AI to do that. They said, I know it's not real, but it still gave me comfort. Okay, now before you're like, oh gosh, these people, I want you to think about yourself. Okay, maybe that's not the specific issue, but we can all do that, right? I know this isn't real. I know this isn't what God's word says. I know this isn't orthodoxy. I know that's not timeless truth, but it makes me feel better. So I'm going to choose it. And this is what happens when we start to let go of these timeless truths. When we stop knowing this, we stop reading this, we stop studying this, we stop passing this on to the next generation. This is the pickle we get into. We start to pick up lies. We start to exchange the truth for lies. Okay, here's another thing I have to cover before we go over these next nine, 10 weeks. You have to understand this. The things we're gonna talk about, they are not, they are not, they are not. Everybody say they're not. they're not. They are not political issues. These were issues long before America existed. These are things that have affected people that God created and God loves since the beginning of human history. Now, a lot of these issues, I will admit, have been politicized, but they are not political issues. And today, I just want to address the lie that pastors and churches shouldn't talk about politics, shouldn't be involved in politics. Lie, lie, lie. These are scriptural issues that, that we must speak to. Not political, but politicized. These are personal holiness issues. And there's always someone says, well, but what about separation of church and state? Yeah, you're missing the whole point of that. Separation of church and state is not to protect the state from the church. It's to protect the church from the state. Don't get that backwards. Super important. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. That's a, that is a lie. If we believe the lie that Christians, the church, um, pastors should not be involved in or speak to politics, um, eventually we have no voice. Because eventually the world takes everything and says, this is political. So when we believe and affirm that lie, don't believe and affirm that lie. Do me a favor, you hear a Christian say something like that, set them straight. Sit them down and have a little talk. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. <laughs> let me tell you how a real American thinks how a real Christian think. Here, just do this. If they say that, just say, can you show me a Bible verse about that? There's not one. The scriptures do not teach that. But a lot of people teach that. It's funny some of the stuff that creeps into the church, isn't it? It's almost like Paul was right when he was talking to Timothy. They will accumulate for themselves truths to suit their own passions. I've wondered for a long time if if that idea in the church, stay out of politics, is really just so that, that people maybe don't have to deal with biblical issues, personal holiness issues, sin issues. I, I want to remind you, we don't get to play God. We don't get to construct some wall around certain issues just because we don't want to deal with those issues. God loves us too much to let us do that. He wants to talk to us about everything that can destroy our lives. We've got to deal with it. Not to mention, if there is a Bible verse about this, here's the closest one. You want to hear it? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. I'm writing these things to you, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I'm delayed, you'll know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, and here it is, which is the pillar and foundation of truth. 
The government's not the pillar and foundation of truth. The schools are not the pillar and foundation of truth. You and I, in and of ourselves, by ourselves, without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus, and without each other, are not the pillar and the foundation of truth. The church is. The church, not just any church, the church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of truth. So, we cannot be indifferent towards these truths. Because technically, check this out. We call them our truths. Technically, these are not our truths. They're God's truths. Technically, this is God describing himself. And I love how God described himself in John 14. You've probably heard this verse before. This is Jesus. He says in verse six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that good? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. The timeless truths of our faith, orthodoxy, it still matters. This stuff right here, it is optimal for human flourishing. This stuff right here, it brings hope. This stuff right here, it brings change. This stuff right here, it brings healing. This stuff right here, it brings wisdom. This stuff right here, it brings joy. This stuff right here, it brings blessings. This stuff right here, it gives us endurance. It's optimal for our flourishing. It's not old and out of date. It's perfect and holy and good and true and living and active and breathing. And it changes us. We can't forget that and we can't exchange that for a lie. So hopefully I've at least got you thinking about timeless truths, orthodoxy. Now let's get practical. Let's get practical for a second. I always want to help you in your faith and, and get real practical. Why do we need to choose orthodoxy, not heresy? Okay, again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I got three points for you. The way, the truth, the life. Number one, what you believe informs the way you live. What you believe informs the way you live. What you believe informs your ethics and, and your morals. Okay, so for example, when you were a little bitty, you believed in a jolly guy with a white beard and a red suit. So the night before Christmas, you were the sweetest little kid in the world. You believed in something, so it informed the way that you lived, at least for 24 hours or so, right? If you believe it's hot outside, you might wear shorts to church. If you believe it's hot outside, you probably turn on your air conditioner. You don't, you don't believe it's hot outside. It is hot outside. Amen? Some of you, you believe it's hot outside, so you switch from real coffee to iced coffee, which is fake coffee. Just want you to know. I am not a heretic and I will not do that. If you're a flat earther, I told you we're going to go some places. If you're a flat earther, you believe the earth is flat, so you're scared to fly from the north to the southern hemisphere. You're like, really? Yeah, really. I've talked to one before and he won't do it. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> there, sounds like there's a lot of flat earthers in here. Okay. What I'm trying to get you to see is when you believe a certain way, you, you start to behave a certain way. Your belief affects your living. Wow. What you believe about God, his word, okay, changes how you live as a Jesus follower each and every day. Now, to, just to be really clear, because I don't want anyone to get confused on this, um, you cannot behave your way into heaven. You cannot be good enough your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into heaven. You are not saved by works. You are only saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But, there's a but, and the but gets left out a lot of times, right? You're not saved by behavior or works, but salvation is supposed to change you. It's supposed to change how you behave how you live, what you think. In fact, I'd say your faith is proven that your belief you say you have, it's proven by the changes in how you live. Actually, I didn't say that. It's written in the book of James chapter two. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe. Wow. Even the demons... I believe, that's all I need. Even, here's what Jesus said, even the demons believe, guys. Come on. And then we throw back to Timothy. That's an immature way of thinking about your faith. 
even the demons believe, and shudder. Like at least have a little bit of a concept of the holiness and perfection of God. Anybody can say they believe. He says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And then he gives Abraham and Rahab the prostitute as examples. And he writes, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, here's the nail in the coffin, faith apart from works is dead. Faith apart from works is dead. You cannot behave your way into heaven, but your belief in heaven, your belief in Jesus, your belief in his blood being the perfect sacrifice for your sin, your belief in the finished work of Jesus, it should result in some change, in some works. Faith without works is dead. Belief with no behavior change is dead. Your faith is proven by the changes in how you live. Now, here's a really cool thing. My goal is not to get anyone to behave. That's not my job. My job as pastor is not to get you to behave. It's to help you get to a point where you believe so strong, so certain with such a firm foundation that you can't be shaken in that belief because only that kind of belief will change how you behave, will change how you live, will change what you think about and what you say and how you live this life. And it's the timeless truths of our faith, orthodoxy, that helps us close the gap between what we say we believe and how we live, which is the journey we are all on called sanctification. We all have these gaps. We all have these places where there's actually not integrity, where we say we believe this, but then if we're honest, we look at part of our life and we are not living as if someone, as a person that believes this. We've all got those, that, that's the whole, point of this whole thing. So, so what do you believe? Just kind of showing you how this works. What, what do you believe? Do you truly believe the Holy Spirit is with you? If you do, you'll leave today. You'll go out into the world. You'll stop being scared to share the truth of the gospel with people because you have the Holy Spirit. If you really believe that, it will change how you live. You won't be scared of questions anymore. You won't back down anymore just because they seem better uh, at what, what they're doing, more informed. You, you won't be scared of that. You got the Holy Spirit. Do you really believe that? Men, Men, we had warrior yesterday. I just got to ask you, do you truly believe God created the family unit and empowered you to lead that family unit? Do you really believe that? If you really believe that, men, then go lead your family. Make your actions match that belief. Do you believe it? Do you believe in the power of prayer? I, hope, let's, I just hope everyone could agree on that one. Like if you're a Christian, surely you believe in the power of prayer. If you believe in the power of prayer, lay hands on people and pray for people believing in healing and change that God's gonna do something good. You see how what you believe should begin to affect how you live, how you behave. Number two, the truth, okay? The way, the truth. The truth you behold transforms you. What do you behold? When we behold something, we hold it up. We give it authority in our life. It provides identity to us. We, we, we gaze at it. It's what we're fixed on. It's what we're focused on. And transformation in our lives takes place by the authority of what it is we choose to behold in this life. It says in Jeremiah 6, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Do you behold the, the word of God? Is this the truth that you behold? If so, it will transform you. If this is an object of scorn for you, you don't take any pleasure in this, it's not gonna change your life. And by the way, when this scripture was written, what was happening with God's people was the truth had been completely inverted. And the reason it had been inverted was God's people stopped beholding God's word to them. They had become complacent towards the word of God. They had stopped looking at the word of God. 2 Corinthians 3 says, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. The result of beholding the glory of the Lord is being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So what do you behold? Do you behold God and his word in and over your life or do you, do you behold something else? And, and again, what you behold, it transforms you. It's what brings identity to you, whatever you're fixing your eyes on. So, so what are you fixed on? 
Like so many Christians never, ever, ever read God's word. They don't actually behold God's word. They say they believe, but then they wonder, why is my life always falling to, to pieces? You're not beholding the word of the Lord. You're not gazing intently at the one thing that can transform things. Where, where do you get your identity from? People get their identity from, from all kinds of places today. It's supposed to be the thing that we behold. What are you beholding? If you behold the word of the Lord and God and his presence in your life and, and his church and these things that God's word teaches us to hold up and look at and allow to transform us, you'll get your identity here. And identity is such an important conversation, isn't it? Today, the world is struggling to answer questions like this. Who am I? Do I matter? Younger generation, am I a boy or a girl? Am I worth anything to anyone? Am I loved or am I not loved? And, and see, here's the thing. When you lack personal identity, you will gravitate towards anything that will give it to you. So when we stop beholding what we need to be beholding, we start to grab our identity from all of these twisted places. What are you beholding? The truth you behold transforms you. Jesus said he is the way, the truth that we must behold. To be just crystal clear on that, we have to give a compelling picture of what it means to find identity in Christ again, church, especially for the younger generation. Here's the last one. The blueprints you choose direct the life you build. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. The blueprints you choose direct the life you build. We all choose blueprints for life, don't we? Every one of us. Uh, we're working on our final blueprints for our church building right now. Uh, the city meeting, by the way, I asked you to pray for on Friday went amazing. Thank you for praying, church. Don't stop praying. But we're working on final blueprints. And what will happen is we'll finalize those, those blueprints. We'll hand them to the contractor. And the, the contractor won't build what he wants to build. He will build exactly what the blueprints say to build. And you're building a life. You're building a legacy. You're building the next generation. So what blueprint have you chose? First Corinthians chapter three says, brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk and not solid food because you weren't ready for anything stronger and you still aren't ready. For you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You're jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world. Verse 18, stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you're wise by this world standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. What blueprints are you choosing? God has given us a living blueprint, his word and his Holy Spirit and his family, the church. And the best thing about choosing God's blueprint is God made us, he blueprinted us. He knows exactly what we need. It's so much better than any blueprint from the world. And what's happening today is so many people are trying to get their blueprint from the world and mix in some Jesus. That ain't gonna work. Or even worse, some people are trying to rewrite God's blueprint. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So I ask you, orthodoxy or heresy? That's your choice. There's not an in-between. There's not an in-between. Timeless truths or heresy? And not everybody likes that question or that conversation. It's not comfortable for everybody um, because encountering a truth that you feel powerless to change is uncomfortable, but that doesn't change the fact that it's still truth. It's still truth. So what do you choose? Isn't it interesting today how we can all catch ourselves wanting a customized faith? We can all do that, right? It's kind of like this heat wave that, that we're dealing with. What we tend to do is, you know, in San Antonio, uh, we're still outside some in June and a little bit into July, but after the 4th of July, man, we stay inside. Why? Because you can customize the environment. Punch that HVAC all the way down, baby. We go into 66, right? 65. It is too hot outside. And that's what so many people are doing in their faith today. Like, I want what I want, how I want. It's fine to do that with the Texas heat, but that doesn't work in the Christian faith. You have to choose orthodoxy or, or heresy. And here's the cool thing about orthodoxy. It actually calls us out into the sunlight. 
away from these, I'll call them domesticated doctrines and palatable heresies of our time into this wild, awesome, life-changing frontier with Jesus Christ. If you couldn't latch onto that, let me say it this way. Don't go to Chick-fil-A tomorrow and order a cheeseburger. Don't do it. You know why? They don't have cheeseburgers, right? They got a really cool new chicken sandwich with some honey on it, and, and I'm already hungry at the first service, right? But, but they don't do cheeseburgers. So you don't walk into Chick-fil-A and say, I want a cheeseburger, okay? And, and what's happening today is people are walking into church asking for a cheeseburger at Chick-fil-A. People are walking into church and, and asking for approval of things that the Word of God does not approve of. And so if you walk in and you ask that, here's what we'll say. No, because we love you. No, because it's gonna hurt you. No, because you could just go to the statistics and studies of the world and see this isn't good for you. We don't even have to open up the Bible to see this won't help you. No, we don't do that here. We do this here. No cheeseburgers, just Chick-fil-A right here. That's, that's what we do. We can only do what the word of God says. That's it. That's it. And until Christians get back to that, that's what's called orthodoxy. This whole thing, it's going to continue to crumble. It's going to continue to fall to pieces and feel like more like hell on earth. That's what it's going to feel like. More like hell on earth than the kingdom. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? So many people say it one, one last time, one last way. They want the Christian faith minus repentance. They want heaven without hell. They want the Christian faith without God's design for family and sexuality and gender. People want a kingdom without the king. Even worse, some people want to be the king, but Jesus is king. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So I just ask you, every one of you, if you're a Christian, orthodoxy or heresy, where are you at? And if you're not a Jesus follower, I plead with you, I beg you, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Trust him by faith. Go on this journey with us. I think what you'll find is that there's a God that loves you and has made a way where it just feels like there can be no way. If you're ready to take that step of surrendering your life to him, the Bible says you simply tell him yes. And we want to lead you in a prayer to do that. You can pray like this. We're going to pray with you. Can we all pray together? Heavenly Father, I surrender. I choose you, God, your kingdom, your king, not me. Jesus is Lord, not me. Thank you for his cross, his blood, and his resurrection. I have a lot to learn, but today I choose by faith to follow Jesus. I repent from my sin. Make me new, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's make some noise for what God's doing.